Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and we have an uh, a little a little theological mathematical equation for you. What do you get when you combine faith, gender, sexuality, and film? That's right, the first film festival that ever exploited those intersections. Right there, the Level Ground Film Festival, and its co-founders Samantha and Chelsea are on the podcast. And not only that, their friend uh, Ryan. Uh, who you may also know as Ryan Bell. Um, he brought them down to the Redondo Beach headquarters, and we discussed this uh, first film festival exploring faith, gender, and sexuality. Um, not only will you hear about the film festival that's headed to Pasadena, California, February 20th to March 2nd, um, and the way you can support the festival and such, um, not only that, uh, but you'll hear the story of how the first LGBT student group at Fuller Theological Seminary, the world's largest evangelical seminary, uh, the first one to ever sanction such a student group called One Table, Um, how uh, uh, these two young ladies started that group, created a community, developed a film festival out of it. Yeah, right here. And and you can listen to it. It's going to be an amazing story. Uh, It's exciting. And then we end up uh, moving from like discussions of film, the festival, that kind of stuff, to their own experiences and stories in evangelical circles, and then asking the questions and all the things around these issues and how film can be used to open up uh, conversations across dividing lines that don't normally happen. And uh, we also find out that they do have an agenda with their film festival, Dignity. You'll find it out. It's a secret. It's coming. Um, Anyway, before we jump into the interview, which is an exciting one, I want to tell John, Jonathan, Jonathan Wydell, I think, that's how you say his name, uh, I want to give him a shout out. This de- this episode is dedicated to you, for you, or the one that hopped on that PayPal donate button on the website, and uh, made a little donation to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. I also want to thank whoever it was that decided to go on an Amazon link from Homebrewed Christianity and buy a, a brand new... Um, vacuum cleaner. I had no idea that homebrewed Christianity could help pay its bills and such by you getting your vacuum cleaner. So if you're getting a vacuum cleaner, you can get them on Amazon. And then you can also uh, help us uh, at the same time. A couple things coming up for homebrewed Christianity deacons. Uh, there is uh, going on right now a, a, a homebrewed Christianity online blogging book tour of John Caputo's new book, The Insistence of God. And that part, that, that tour is going to uh, reach its climax November 6th. That's a Thursday night, November 6th, when uh, John Caputo will be having a live video book party on the website. So you'll be able to just, just come on over the website. You'll, f- you'll find out all the details as it gets closer. But you'll be able to sit back in your room on a Thursday night with your friends and uh, have uh, Jack Caputo pop up on your screen and uh, he and I talk talk about the book we'll talk about the questions and everything that came from the people who've been blogging about it so there you go get ready for that november 6th and also um johnny and i johnny um uh he's recently started blogging some with us at homebrewed christianity and myself are headed off in march to the progressive youth ministers conference in chicago march 19th through the 21st chicago progressive youth ministry you should check that event out and come hang out with us um, and if you are coming, let us know because uh, Johnny and I are putting together a little homebrewed Christianity diaconate tour of craft breweries in Chicago. And so not only would you get to go to this progressive youth ministry conference, get to hang out with us and tons of their uh, diverse uh, speakers and other uh, people that are working with uh, um, students and college students, that kind of thing, and learn stuff and, and have fun, you would get to go on a tour of craft breweries with us. And it's going to be grand. It's going to be s- smashing. Anyway, uh, that's about it for now. Um, right now, just get ready to meet my two new friends who are about to be your audiological friends, at least, uh, Chelsea and Samantha, and then, um, you know, go over to their website. Uh, it, it support them on the Indiegogo. That's hip these days, so you can do it. And um, be excited if you are a SoCal resident because the Level Ground Film Festival is headed your way. Um, and if you are a film-type person, you can even submit. Uh, starting November 1st, submit your own film to be a part of the festival. Hmm? Yes, you're welcome. Now... Here's a little word from the the elder of homebrewed Christianity for, or no, he's bishop, I believe, bishop of Arizona, 
uh, than the interview. Peace. What's up, Deacons? This is Bishop Zach Lind from Arizona, and you're listening to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. You're welcome. Christianity listeners, this is Trip, and uh, I'm my friend, friend of the podcast, Ryan Bell, is sitting right here. What's up, Ryan? Hey, good to be here, man. I know, and I have been trying to get you on the podcast, and you're like, oh, that's great, that's great, that's great. Did you know I have some fine ladies in my entourage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you you live far away, and I, I was like, yeah, I'll do the podcast, and then I'm like, Redondo Beach, bro, that is, that's a long haul, but well, it turns out it only takes half an hour to get down here. If you leave at the right time. Yeah. yeah. All right, so can but you I introduce do have, everyone? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had the privilege of meeting these two young ladies a couple of well, like a year ago. Uh, Chelsea McIntriff. Did I say that right? Nope. No. <sighs> Try again. I don't, I've never <laughs> said your last name out loud before. <laughs> wow, that's Chelsea funny. M. Chelsea McIntriff. <laughs> McIntriff. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's that's normal because it's the MC. Yeah. 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 So Chris Chelsea McIntriff. <laughs> and Samantha Curley. Um, when I met them, we're students at Fuller Theological Seminary, the founding presidents of well, the One Table organization. And I had done some work in the city of Los Angeles around civil discourse and Proposition 8 and LGBT concerns, and that's how we met. Awesome. So, uh, and, and before we get into hearing the long the version of the story and excitement, what is it that all three of you are excited about? Who does the best 90-second um, pitch of a film festival? I'm going to keep Great. talking until, until you I lean in. You. Yeah, because I don't like to have to edit out blank spots. Oh, okay. Great. So talk over. Just uh, smile well, we... <laughs> into the microphone with your voice. <laughs> uh, Chelsea and Ryan and I are all working together uh, with an organization called Level Ground. Ooh, what's the website? Uh, the website is onlevelground.org. Okay. Every, hold on. Onlevelground.org. They're typing it in their smartphone right now. Uh-huh. All right. Go ahead. Great. Uh, and we <laughs> we use art and work with art to create safe space for dialogue about faith, gender, and sexuality. And as a part of that work, we host the world's first faith-based LGBT film and arts festival. All right. And and why would you think that's a good idea? Because um, I don't think it's a good idea. No, I'm just <laughs> I, yeah, I'm against it. Uh, I, I recognized early on how depraved I was. And that I wanted to demonstrate that verbosely by running a center film festival. Um, uh, no, we. I, I studied theology and art at Fuller and have always been interested in the way art can help us reach uh, and enter into uncomfortable conversations, um, enter spaces and ask questions and answer questions without realizing kind of what's happening to us. So we found in our work with one table and, um, trying to communicate with people who disagree with one another and are polarized and don't often engage with one another, that art kind of creates this space where we can enter together and meet each other in a different kind of space. So, um, you actually think conversing is a good idea and people like movies Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. we have found that it's just, as a culture, we will pay $10 to see a movie that may depict a story that we don't agree with. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I saw 12 Years a Slave last week, uh, and it's incredibly difficult to sit in that film, regardless yeah. of who you are. And yet I, I would pay $10 to go see that film. And so we are willing to sit in someone else's story when we watch film and... um in this conversation, it's so important to have storytelling be a part of what the conversation is. And film just provides a great space for that to happen. So people right now, after they're looking at the website, are going to their calendar, so we don't forget to do this later. Mm-hmm. What dates would they show up at a film festival? Um, and I, I don't know that there are movies that are $10 in Los Angeles, but maybe that's the case. <laughs> I was going to say, where do you guys see a movie for 10 bucks? <laughs> I want to go there. The Level Ground Film Festival yeah. oh. is where you see a movie for $10. Oh. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, so what are what are the dates? The dates are February 20th to March 2nd, 2014 in Pasadena, mm-hmm. California. And where are, where are they showing like in on a flat screen in your basement or 
<laughs> right here in your garage. Oh, I do. I would love to love to show one movie in my garage. It's just so far down here. <laughs> it's just half an hour. <laughs> Carpool. We're having vans come down. No, we're um, we're actually our our hope is to kind of take over Pasadena and Old Town Pasadena. So we're at several different venues. Um, our main stage theater is going to be the Lemley Playhouse. Oh, cool. And we're doing a series of private galas. So those are going to be screenings limited to forty people, and you'll get to have dinner or lunch, engage with the people in the audience with you, and then also with filmmakers and um, really great speakers from across the country. And those are going to be at Lineage Dance Studio in Pasadena and Jones Coffee Roasters. Uh, We're doing a legacy series, so we're showing films that have been important and iconic in this conversation. Um, We're showing those at the First United Methodist Church. Uh Uh, And then we're doing uh, some galas and parties at the Armory Center for the Arts. Sweet. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, are you going to get that back room at Haven? Yes. Yeah. I think you Gastro should. Gastropub? Yes. Oh, that, I've never the been back, there. You have I've never, been, I've never been in the back room. I well, love the place, but yeah, I've never yeah, been in the back room. I have, I have that idea of, of like, you could probably have a podcast back there. Um, do you want to do a podcast yeah, yeah. at Haven was, during the film festival? I didn't want to be direct. just want to yeah. do it while we were recording. You guys, we should yeah. probably invite him to do a podcast. Um, Consider uh, this your official all invitation. Right, all right. So, um... So, uh, so, so this is a festival, and this isn't the first time it's happening, but it's blown up since you incidentally set it up. All right, so at Fuller, you started a student group <laughs> <laughs> that then incidentally ends up running a film festival, and now it's, it, it's your job, and you're making an impact not just in the seminary students at Fuller's lives, but um, uh, in this kind of whole conversation around art and culture in uh, Pasadena and L.A. and such. So, so maybe you can tell me, like, what made it make sense to you to start a student group at Fuller um, that is uh, on the uh, rambunctious side. Like, I, I've heard messages from uh, fellow friends that teach there that they're real supportive on the DL. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. Right, exactly like, everything you just said is true. Yeah, Care- see, it would be like being, it would be like at, um, the DL. It, would be, it would be like at Claremont School of Theology if we had a, like, an evangelism group. Uh-huh. Uh, yes. Yeah. They. You would not. No one would really want to publicly support. They're like, no. You know, they're asking, uh, asking Jews to <laughs> ask Jesus in their heart. We really can't support that here. Um, oh gosh. It, that would. It would be like that. Yes. So anyway, till that. <laughs> sure. It's been quite the crazy journey. I um, came to Fuller in in 2011, and I came from. Uh, Maryland, like that's where I grew up, and I went to Messiah College for undergrad, and it was in that context at Messiah that I figured out that I was gay, and uh, it was a rough journey kind of navigating that space, and I grew up in a conservative part of Maryland. I went to this conservative undergrad. I was conservative myself, and the only narrative that I knew was um, that you had to be straight. I mean, that was it. That was the only option, and so as I kind of journeyed for what was about five years in my own space, I came to have a different conclusion um, and learned that there were like other narratives and other options. And um, it was in that transition that I really realized that I wanted to go to grad school and that I also felt really comfortable being in the middle. I had come from this conservative background myself. I had been a conservative. I then had transitioned to this more liberal um, point of view, but I felt more comfortable in the conservative church and yet didn't get Um, really any welcoming there and then uh, felt really uncomfortable in a liberal context. So it was Mm. just a weird middle space. And so I had wanted to go to the school fuller that had these really diverse points of view in one space and felt like I could navigate that conversation as someone who kind of stands in this middle space myself. Uh, And so I came to fuller thinking I would go get my PhD and, and didn't really found out pretty quickly that that wasn't going to be the track. And then around the same time I decided that, I got asked to start a student group. A friend of mine, um, James Farlow, had come to me and said, hey, it's time. Fuller's ready. Um, you need to start the student group. Co- one caveat is that you can't be, we can't be political within Fuller or outside of Fuller. And that was totally fine with me. I, I wasn't interested in that anyway. And so um, I started one table and I couldn't lead it by myself. And so I asked Sam to start it with me and, um, Sam is Samantha, who's Samantha Curley. Next to her. 
Yeah. Well, I know, but she was introduced as Samantha. <laughs> it's true. I'm like, who is the Sam man? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You assume Sam is a man. Keep uh, going. See, I don't do that. Anyway. I'm guessing for the listeners, see, if they just assume that Sam is a man, mm-hmm. they're now feeling like crap. Yes, probably. Yeah. We've shamed them. Yeah. Publicly. And the only it's way bad. you can get over that is to come to the film festival <laughs> this February. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah. So I asked Samantha to lead the fest- um, lead the student group with me and... Um, unintentionally, honestly, we just ended up being this great combination, Sam being straight and me being gay proved to be this like kind of model for conversation. So different people showed up in the room, uh, expecting different things and asking us different questions. And so that created this kind of, um, safe space. And we also were, we could both come from young life backgrounds. And Mm -hmm. so we're really passionate about meeting people where they're at and being ambassadors for the conversation. And, um, creating a space where we're not talking about theology first, we're building relationships. And so that's kind of the foot that we started on and it just, just boomed. So, so what is it, what, a, what does a, a gathering look like on campus at Fuller? And, uh, you know, a lot of people listening, if they are, uh, of the just more pr- progressive variety, you know, Fuller in, uh, and is the same as Bob Jones, more or less, you know, for, uh, kind of progressive Christians are like, that's an evangelical school. They don't like global warming, gay people or science. And like uh, that, that's just kind of what's in their head. And uh, if you're an evangelical people, Fuller's kind of on the edge. They've mm-hmm. always been, they've always engaged in historical criticism and all. They have Nancy Murphy's there oh, doing gosh. religion and science and that kind of thing. So, um, uh, but it comes out of a the evangelical culture where the issues around sexuality are just play a very different boundary role than they do in kind of mainline Protestant circles. So um, when when we hear it's progressives that, you know, evangelicals are just talking about it. Mm-hmm. It's so easy for us just to go, oh, my God, welcome to the 1980s. Right. Uh, why don't you hurry up? It's a justice issue. Get over it. And if they're bigots, tell them. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe you could share a little bit about that experience and how opening the space, be it in conversations or in film, is actually a real liberating activity. And that what yeah. a lot of us more progressive people do really shuts down conversations and keeps mm-hmm. people trapped. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, until you've been there, right? Yeah. You won't know what it, what it's like. Yeah. yeah. Well, we started our first meeting. Um, we started talking about language and trying to define and unpack some of the words that we use when we're talking to uh, the LGBT community. And that was really important, I think, because we, we have to live inside the words that we have. And if we don't even have words to communicate across those differences, we're going to be stuck. Um, So that was a really great, I think, first step for us of saying, here are some words, here's how we talk about it, here's some language that we can equip and empower you with to actually meet someone who's different from you. Uh, And from there, we just would meet, we'd always meet and have a meal, feel really strongly that food kind of creates a space um, at the table for us to be together. And we just ask questions and let people talk, share their stories, uh, ask their own questions, and start to engage and get closer and closer, moving away from this as an issue to being a person to then maybe being something about justice or, you know, whatever it is you you move into from there. And film uh, honestly just opens that up even more because we have this three-tiered system that we were operating on. We had this core group of people that we had committed to being safe people. Uh, They were the leaders of one table. And so those people were, you could come to and you could be like, no matter where you are, if you're choosing to be celibate, you're um, wanting to be more affirming, you can come to this person. They are a safe person to talk to. And so this was like our young life-ness coming out. Mm -hmm. And then we had this next tier, which were these dinners. Um, And then the film festival and other film events that we had done throughout the year were kind of our third tier, and that was the larger events. And the one, I think, great thing about a film festival and about film is that you can show up and be anonymous. You know, for someone who's had a really hard time being a part of the conversation and and this is something that maybe the more progressive community doesn't understand, even talking about it is hard. And so getting an opportunity to come into a room and hear a story that's different than them is a step. I mean, it's a huge step. And Mm -hmm. it's a step to say that I am willing to listen. Mm -hmm. And we're not looking to change people's minds. We want people willing to listen to someone who is their quote-unquote other. Um, And film offers a space for them to show up and do that without the kind of responsibility of being around a table and sharing a meal with people. Mm-hmm. And that sometimes is, sometimes is really necessary in order to even start the conversation. 
So so what was the film that y'all showed and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is a good idea. <laughs> like, because, you know, most people don't think, um, oh, a student group, this is going well, film festival. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I, you know, I assume that there's there, I thought that was there's a very moment. logical yeah. progression. <laughs> we, we had this idea of we both really like film. We've studied it, been a part of making film. You know, like, let's just do a film festival. And that was right around the time that I had gone or was going to Sundance um, through Fuller with their – one of their classes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I saw the film God Loves Uganda there and met the director, uh, Roger Ross Williams. And we invited him to come to Fuller and he was really excited about it because he had made this documentary film about the evangelical church and their influence on politics uh, in Africa and Uganda in particular and really wanted to show it to the conservative audience. And so he was stoked to come to Fuller. Uh, so this film, he's an Academy Award winning director, makes this documentary that premieres at Sundance, wins awards at Sundance, and then no one else in the entire world sees it till it comes to Fuller Seminary. I mean, it just was a joke. Um, and that... <laughs> I mean, honestly. But a good joke. <laughs> a good joke, yeah. I mean, it was a student group that had existed for less than a year at right. that point. So. Right. Um, and that, it was a really, it was it was a tough film to sit through. It is a tough film to sit through for the conservative evangelical church. And it was tough for Roger to stand in front of that audience and receive questions that were asked and to know how to talk about it. And, you know, Roger is not... Uh, a Christian and is not Ugandan and he's made a film about Christians in Uganda. So I think for him and for us, we both realized like we need each other to make this film mean something. And that kind of started this relationship. I mean, the entire film festival was awesome in the films that we showed, but I think that the relationship we formed with Roger in that film has proved, um, I think a lot in terms of what we're doing. And so we ended up writing the faith-based discussion guide that goes along with the film. Um, Roger talks about us and being at the festival everywhere he goes. Um, It's, you know, premiering its theatrical release tomorrow in LA and I'm speaking on a panel with him. Like it just has been a really good relationship. So I think that film and what happened after that proved to us like this matters and we need help translating sometimes, um, art and its content to the people that are seeing it. So, so how did, um, kind of that first initial, uh, film viewing, uh, play out in the relationships you were already building on campus. So when all of a sudden, uh, I mean, that's like an external validation Mm -hmm. of something that if you're just thinking in your seminary community, a seminary is like a, a, uh, the, like every problem that comes with church politics, but intensified (laughs) because people come in and out all the time. And uh, and, and you're smart. all going in debt <laughs> yes. to be there. So uh-huh. it would be like you had to give a max amount to the building campaign. And now it's so like it, it, people don't understand unless you've been to a seminary or divinity mm-hmm. school just how political and intense mm-hmm. everything is. And yeah. we're all supposed to be perfect. Too. Oh, because because you're uh, the, like gay. the spiritual <laughs> yeah. elite. And not gay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, you can be gay. You just can't enjoy being gay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yep. Because <laughs> it's, yeah. you know. It's, no, I think it's all about how you use the parts. Yeah, Pie. I, <laughs> sorry. It's we had done. We did this film festival, you know. And I was thinking about this. Like, there's this twofold aspects of what kind of encouraged us on, and one being that there's a, two Academy Award winners that showed up. I mean, that was like incredible. And then the other thing was this tangible, hard to describe. I don't know, beautiful thing that happens when reconciliation happens in uh-huh. a, in a room, you know. And we had. We're like, oh, we need to do a survey afterwards. So we did this survey afterwards and we had all of these people write to back to us. Like, you know, I never take a survey and fill in the blanks. Like if you give me a paragraph section, I'm like going to give you a word and that's it. Or N-A. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not and, applicable. Yeah. And yet we had like 50 people out of the 300 plus people that came that wrote back paragraphs of like, this is so important. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for creating this space. We had friends that came up to us and been like, I've been struggling with my sexuality. I've had nowhere to go. And this is a place that I felt safe and comfortable to deal with that. And I um, just, we've watched friends reconcile across difference. We've gotten to sit around tables with people who are so incredibly different, who have like the most polarized opposite stories and then look at each other and be like, I've never heard someone's story like yours. And I think that that's, 
that's the heart of what we're doing. That is where Level Ground happens. The the Academy Award winner parts are like the part that encourage us to think that, oh, we maybe we can actually do this. Mm-hmm. But the the beautiful outcomes of Level Ground are the small, tangible relationships that change and build over time to see each other differently. And that we've got to watch that. I mean, that's where yeah. that's why we're doing what we're doing, you know. So, so you've uh, you've got the uh, Indiegogo campaign. You've got you, the festival you described is clearly bigger than three hundred people. <laughs> what what happened to make it explode and now occupy all of y'all's time in since the last one? So maybe you can tell us where where all this energy is coming from for this coming festival. Well, since since the last festival, it's just been an insane kind of journey. That's it, we talk about it like a movement that we're just kind of catching up to, you know. And um, early on, when we first got started, we had a couple people like Religious News Service, um, Glad, call us and be like, "No one else is doing this. You have to do this on a national level." And Sam had accepted a job, and we were just like, "This is it. Like we have to do this." And so. Um, we can't resist the movement of God, you know, and well, we could, but we didn't want to be those kind those of people. people. Yeah. And so sin- stories don't usually end well. <laughs> yeah. And so since then, it's just been, um, a continuation of really what we experienced at Fuller on a, on a micro level, on a much more macro level. I mean, we've said, sent so many cold emails of like believing that this is a thing that people want and people respond. And we have, I mean, 40 plus national, incredible we call them as like intellectual celebrities and then all theological celebrities and then you know uh well-known human rights activists that are have agreed to come to this film festival and speak on panels i mean that they don't even necessarily know us or have a history with level ground but they believe in this happening and that's just continue to be exponentially true and so with the Indiegogo campaign, we just continue to have that happen. We have, you know, friends that call us about them. We're like, we love what you're doing. Take $500. And we're like, yes, that's amazing. I will take it. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and I think we realized pretty early on, like, if, if we were going to make this happen, we had to do it full time. And so, uh, you know, we're both making a lot of personal sacrifices for that to be the case, um, i.e. we're not getting paid yet ourselves. But <laughs> um, there's just no no way we would be able to do what we're doing if we weren't doing it full time. So we're making life work. So as y'all are looking forward to this festival, what parts of it like get you most excited? Like, so I've, I mean, I've planned lots of events and we're like, uh, my advisor, Philip and I got this grant from the Ford foundation. We ran all these events and like every time you're putting it on, when you're running stuff, you have like almost no fun during it, but you always have like that thing you're not going to miss. You're like, mm-hmm. I'm just showing up for that. So if mm-hmm. it, the part where you like take off, I'm directing a festival hat and show up and you're like, no, I'm just watching. Uh, what 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 part of that are you most excited about? For me, I think there's like a twofold part of it. The fact that there are all these incredible speakers, people that I've like wanted to meet my whole life um, are coming to speak. Yeah, you should name drop that way. Yeah, like... Uh, David Gushy, Chris Stedman, um, Kai Dickinson, uh, these incredible directors, these incredible um, minds that are willing to be a part of this conversation that I'm just, I can't wait. I'm so excited. Um, and I think also I'm, I'm really proud and anticipatory of our opening night gala. I think it's going to be incredible. I think the performance that's going to happen there is moving. And I love, we do a lot to make intentional choices about space and um, listening and what you're actually doing to be participating in the conversation. And that space is going to be not only beautiful to sit in, but um, is an intentional listening space. So we start the week off listening to each other and Mm -hmm. having to listen to this thing that's happening. Um, And I I love how that fits into what we're doing and the kind of like beautifulness of that. So personally, the opening night gala and meeting all the speakers is just going to be so much fun. So. I was going to say the opening night gala, but I'll say something else, I suppose. Uh, I'm excited about, so I've been to several film festivals now, and there's sort of this script that happens, the way that a film festival works, and things that if you have been to one, you know to expect. Um, And I'm really excited about the ways that we're trying to innovate that and think differently about it, whether that's including more art around the venues or having all these other speakers join filmmakers, you know, whatever it is, the innovative parts are what's most exciting to me. Um, And so I'm really excited for um, these private galas and to sit in a room with just 40 people and see uh, an an award-winning film 
be this close, you know, right next to the filmmaker and to people who are leaders in the field thinking about these questions and this conversation and actually get to engage with them and with someone who's different from you, whether that's of a different sexual orientation or gender identity or religious conviction, that we're going to be so close to one another, we won't be able to avoid whatever happens. And I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm really excited for those those private gala spaces. So if you're if you're listening and they're like, ah, are these just going to be a bunch of movies about gay people and Christians liking them? Um, like if you're thinking real narrow, right? Because mm-hmm. when you think religion and film, you think of like Kurt Cameron, mm-hmm. right? And neatly folded clothes after the... Stop thinking that. Yeah, so, yeah stop. So when, when you're talking about these movies, what kind of... Uh, like are these movies you're going to enjoy? Like a real movie? Yeah. Like yeah. I'm going to have fun watching this? Or these, like, Debbie Downer festivals. You know, like, sometimes yeah. people are just, uh, you know, like, why, what, what kind of film am I going to see when I go out and watch it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because it's only $10, right? so it's way better than the price I'm going to pay, right, at Regal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 18 Right. I mean, we screened, last year, we screened two Academy Award nominated films where God Loves Uganda had just come off winning Sundance and um, is running for an Oscar right now. Uh, Meaning it's it's putting itself up to try and get selected for an Oscar. And um, we really believe in the craft of film. And so, I mean, I've worked on, on films and the technical aspects of film. And we want to screen good films, not just good com- films for conversation, um, but well-made, great story, great cinematography mm-hmm. um, types of films. Yeah, well, and I think the best example of that is... You know, this year we're taking film submissions, which open November 1st. So if you're a filmmaker, you should submit. Um, so we don't know exactly what films we'll be showing yet. But last year we showed um, Milk and Pariah, How to Survive a Plague. We showed films that are really enjoyable and are award-winning films and let conversation come out of those. So we're not... I think per, for me, one of the reasons that I love film and I'm excited about the idea of a film festival is it's an opportunity for the faith community to sort of hand over the mic and we get to really like sit and listen and see uh, different stories. And so we, we're we not trying to keep it narrow and mm-hmm. make these like Christian films um, or engage in Christian films. We're handing over the mic and we're letting other people tell their stories and speak for themselves and choosing films that are doing that really artfully. Yeah. Um, so what's the, uh, um, when you were talking about, uh, films that have been a part of the history or movement of this kind of conversation, uh, what are some of those? Like what kind of, wh- what did that mean? I assume it means something, but I don't really mm-hmm. hang out in film history. I read dead German philosophers. <laughs> so, um, I mean, is this, uh, yeah. gone with the wind? <laughs> That's a big movie. No, there's been a lot of Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> yeah, Philadelphia. Home Alone. <laughs> Philadelphia is actually one of them. Oh, that yeah. is a, an incredible film. That's a part of the conversation that was had Tom Hanks in it. It was about an AIDS, a man with AIDS, um, and his rights. And Milk is a great example of that. Of it's you know an older film. We sh- we showed it last year. It's not that old, but in the 2000s, and um, it is documenting the history of the LGBT community and um, as a people that want to have this conversation, wherever we are on the spectrum of theological belief, we, we kind of have to understand that the history in order to even have a conversation. I mean, it's like talking about civil rights, but not really understanding any of the history of ac- yeah. the actual civil rights movement. So um, as a community, we're choosing to put these, these iconic films because they tell a story um, over time of the LGBT community that allows us to engage more fully in the um, history of the people. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So I want to, Ryan, who knows y'all better, to ask each of you the question that's like the softball to get you to share whatever it is he thinks you should share. I guess I would say, like, what, what's the what's the outcome that you're hoping, f- you know, what what would be the response that you want to see from the people that are, um, who are you trying to influence? Like, who are you trying to move? Which direction are you trying to move people some direction? Or is it just, if people talk, like physically talk to one another, you'll be happy? Or is there a kind of outcome you're looking for? It's hard. I think it's hard to talk about outcomes because we have so much fear of agenda. And, you know, we really say and really do believe that we don't have a political agenda. We don't have, 
an evangelical agenda. We're not trying to, to make anyone believe or think or live a certain thing or way. But at the same time, I think I really do believe that if we can learn to speak to one another better and we can learn to sit in difference and achieve disagreement in a way that maintains relationship and maintain someone's humanity, like we actually will be creating a better world and participating in a better world. Like when you describe it that way, though, I, I think you should just tell everyone your agenda is dignity because mm-hmm. uh, like when you're saying it's not political or not theological, you're saying we, we aren't doing this so that we can get in a position of power to make you, yeah, you know, agree with us or yep. agree with one of the six options we like and not the other six mm-hmm. that suck. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there isn't. I mean, it's very intentional. You have an agenda to open up a safe space mm-hmm. where um, whoever your other is, you can mm-hmm. encounter. Um, that uh, it is a place that, through art, you're expecting other people to experience and get to know the story of the artist that's there. And um, it's rare, right, that in a faith community, especially one that does tend to politicize a conversation, that um, you, you're you're like insisting on dignity in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It would be like you're trying to be like to show yourself as Christians by the way you love, which is a really odd idea, right? Like <laughs> they'll know we are Christians Shocking. by the way we create signs or, uh, you know, like to me, there Dog is an agenda. It, it's just, yeah. it's one that doesn't make sense in the script. Mm-hmm. We're often handed yes. around yes. sexuality and faith. I love scripts. Do we have permission to use this agenda of dignity? You can do You can say whatever you want. Great. I, I'm taking it. I'll That's give great. you, I'll give you credit. <laughs> Trademark. Trademark. Um, no, I think you're, I mean, I think you're exactly right. It's, it's impossible to be agendaless. I mean, we wouldn't exist if we didn't have agenda. So, our agenda, I think, exactly what you said. It's to to instill more dignity into what it means to be human and in relationship and to live in a world in which we're different from one another. And we're not all going to become the same. We're not all going to look the same or live the same or believe the same. But we can at least um, treat each other with dignity and be in relationship across those differences. Yeah. And I think both of us recognize that there isn't a future in which we're going to all agree. I mean, we're not, both sides should just come to this realization that they're not going to win the other side over for in, eventually, you know, because we're different people. We grow up in different contexts. We come from um, different different social positions. And so we have to recognize that there isn't a future where we're going to be uniform on this. And so how in response to that, do we choose to live? How do we choose to embody the gospel? And I think that, that embodiment of the gospel requires us to love each other across difference, to seek reconciliation, to seek peace. And part of that is to be in relationship with other people that are, are different from ourselves. And I, and I think that along with that is acknowledging that there's nuance and and mystery and complexity in what it means to be human and to be in relationship. Um, and I think that is one of our agendas for sure is to to – introduce and allow us to sit in that nuance Mm -hmm. so ryan um you give us the short version of of your story and come to participate this some people will pick it up online that you used to be employed um and i did uh, one time yeah yeah, that you were a minister Mm -hmm. um at hollywood seventh-day adventist that uh you um are on staff at evangelical schools teaching and things like that and you ran you had a Colluffle, um with your uh, your tradition. So maybe you could tell us your story, and then what is it like to be a part of of this uh, film festival, this movement and conversation that's taking place, um, and 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 how is it heard from you as someone who's you know financially bearing the burden in a sense of insisting upon dignity? Yeah. So from yeah, my story in brief. I mean, for twenty years I was a Seventh Day Adventist pastor, and um, for the last eight of those years was in Hollywood. In an incredible congregation, the most diverse congregation I've ever been a part of in every way. Um, a lot of young people, a lot of what I would call like re- refugees from religion, um, including some atheists, a Buddhist, you know, just people that were there because they valued the community. It was just, I couldn't have like handpicked the, the thing better. You know, it was just so wonderful. Um, and we, I had a particular interest in the Prop 8 uh, situation in 2008 and that 
kind of launched me into a concern about the way that the church was taking a lead role in marginalizing people. Um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a long history of religious liberty advocacy, and it was actually through our religious liberty arm that we were pushing aside, you know, people of, uh, you know, different orientations. And so a few of my friends and I um, started a, a little organization to push back a little bit. And um, that pushback eventually led to some disagreements with my denomination. And um, so we parted ways in, in March. And so a lot of my story has to do with you know, taking the risk of welcoming people into a, a, a safe space, uh, not unlike the kind of space that we're trying to create with level ground. And, you know, coming up against an institution that's really not ready for that space to exist. Um, so part of my, you know, questioning right now is around the fear of why people are so afraid of the conversation. Um, to me, it's sort of like if you come to me, Trip, and you're like, man, Here's, here's what I believe, and I say to you, no, I, don't really, I really don't believe that. And you're like, well, let me tell you this story. And I'm like, no, no, stop right there. I don't want to hear your story. Like, well, no, it's just a story. Like, I just want to tell you the story of my experience and what happened to me. No, 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 no stories. I don't want to hear your story. I'm like, what, what's the harm in hearing a story? Like, let me just tell you my story. And there are really parts of our community that really don't even want to hear the story of someone yet. And so that, for me, is why I feel like... Um, level ground is so important because it, it is an opportunity for people for whatever reason when we step into a movie theater or a screening space we we suspend our judgment for that long we can watch the lord of the rings and go wow that was amazing those orcs that obviously don't exist in the real world but for a moment you kind of imagine that they did and so you know we can even step into a documentary or another type of film and imagine people's lives as really legitimate lives that we might have otherwise just written off. And to me, that's the first step. And, you know, my, my agenda and our agenda at our church was to create a space where people could experience love. And, um, and so, I mean, I think that's again, what we're saying about level ground as well. And I'm, um, sort of taking a chance on these two They're, they've promised that this was going to work. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm holding on to the, their tail, oh the coats of the tail <laughs> of their coat to, to go for the ride here. Uh, what's interesting about people not wanting to hear stories I, it, around this issue, it's to me uh, like my uh, friends who, like when um, when when Al Gore put out his movie, The Inconvenient Truth, uh, where their response was not, oh, well, you know, I guess I would fix this one part scientifically and engaging it and actually, they're just mad about the idea of the movie and that people would look at it and take it seriously. And so all the energy goes on to not hearing the story of our relationship with the planet and its destructiveness. Mm -hmm. And underneath it, I think there's just uh, a lot of people who know the conclusion that they're getting to and are just scared of having to humanize your uncomfortability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Because hearing a story, then you're stuck with the person being like a subject and not an object of your ideology, and you're stuck... Uh, having to look at a, a human and, and essentially cast them out or judge them and things that uh, theoretically Christians should have a hard time doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting to me how threatening uh, stories can be uh, when they kind of know the power. It's like they, they're telling you, I know the power of it. That's why. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's uh, just not, let's just not go there. And so how, how is that opening up of the space coming out of um, kind of the conversations as a student group uh, at Fuller, moving to um, uh, a, a, a conversation, it's not even just evangelicals. Yeah. How, how is that um, being received uh, by the people who you were the first person they said, I might be by sometimes on Thursdays <laughs> between six and nine when I'm running with my friend. Um, and they, you know, and they're, and they're saying that in their whole world's, you know, uh, up for grabs. That's really different than people flying in from all across the country to watch a movie, to have a conversation. So how has the relationship with, uh, those that helped start the student group and things, um, changed as the, uh, the audience in a sense has gotten a lot bigger. Can they still have those safe first steps? That's one of the things I've always wondered. Um, uh, Because I've been the first step for a lot of people, but that's because they listen to the podcast. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and they're like, well, well, I already know what Tripp thinks, so I'll ask him. So there are ministers at really conservative, big evangelical churches who email me, ask to get together, and then they're like, I think God might love gay people, <laughs> and but I'll lose my job if I say it out loud, <laughs> mm-hmm. and let me talk out how I think, how I've come to think about this, and then mm-hmm. it's usually telling a story of a congregant mm-hmm. that they got to know. Yeah. And then they were like, I guess your explanation of the clobber passages is okay now because, well, I met Jesus here in this relationship. And so now, you know, we need to get theology that's as good as, uh, as the actual presence of Christ in our midst. So, um, to me, there's, there's a sense that, uh, uh, how with people that are kind of either in doubt question or pushing back, when it goes to a public, a more public platform, how do you keep it safe yeah. for people that are wanting to ask the question for the first time? Yeah, I think there's a couple things. One, we really try to make we believe that this is just this is inherently a part of our story. To be a part of level ground is to like live into who Sam and I are. Um, as people, we make ourselves available. I mean, we were running this Indiegogo campaign. We had a friend who's run a couple of campaigns and he was like, we were, we really wanted to put our cell phones on there. And we were really passionate about putting our cell phones on there. Um, and he was like, no, don't do it. That's a bad idea. And we're like, no, this is, this is what we believe it means to be a part of level ground is to be people who are available to be in conversation and in relationship with people wherever they are as a part of level ground. And then I think, um, the two other things are as we view ourselves as kind of conversation starters. So when we work with smaller communities, we um, go in and we start the conversation and we have this ability to kind of be an outside space where the conversation can start in a safe way because it's not on anyone else. It's not on the pastor who started it or it's not on a person in the congregation. It's a, on level ground. Um, and then when we leave, that conversation can continue um, within the relationships that have history in those those spaces. Um, and then also, we are really passionate about small venue programming. So the film festival is intentionally programmed so that no space is bigger than 150 people in which you're in a room with those people. Um, if you've ever been to a film festival, that's really unusual. I mean, you normally are in a, in a theater space with 600 to 1,500 people. That's not where you have a conversation that you're talking about. That's for the yeah. per- person who's never talked about this before. So for us, we really want to be intentional about kind of shifting the script of the film festival so that it is – programmed so that you can have a conversation and that you're encouraged to come to multiple things and that you will see people that you see all week long and that those people will become familiar faces and that that's um, creating that safe space because you are seeing another person choose to commit to being unsafe with you. And so you can ask the unsafe question, you know, that makes it ultimately a safe space. So. And I think my hope, I mean, I ended up in this conversation because I took a class and a professor sort of challenged us to become safe people, regardless of what we believed theologically about the LGBT community or an LGBT person, to be someone who's safe, um, to give someone resources, to ask them questions, to walk alongside them as they ask themselves questions. Um, And so I think our hope is that we are gathering this group of people into a conversation and into a dialogue that then they can go out and be those safe people. And so it's, um, in in essence, multiplying what it means to be a safe person. And so hopefully, you know, like at the film festival, we'll have moderators and volunteers and people who will be identified as safe people at that space. And that as we see what that looks like and we see it modeled, we can leave the festival and go and be those safe people in our own context and communities. Oh, cool. So, um, the, uh, your, your film festival and student group are, uh, um, yeah, the student group is related to Fuller Film Festival is not. Right. Yes. Two separate entities. Just to clarify to everyone. Yes. That the film festival is not, uh, related to Fuller Theological Absolutely. Seminary. Not at all. Um, which is different than the student group. Yes. All right. So if you had a film festival and there were all these people coming to it and it was around, Sex trafficking in the United States. Fuller would wrote a, would just write a big check, right, and right. be like, "Look what our students did," <laughs> you know, or, or that kind of thing. Um, and you would not do the film festival and say, "You know what? You were trying to open up a conversation <laughs> around the fact that millions of people are being kidnapped and raped in our cities, mm-hmm. and we just, you know, 
we want love and we just want to share those stories and then you can you can take it where you want so mm-hmm. the, you know, progressive people on the outside yeah it's just these kind of things you're like well, i'm really glad someone's doing that but it's really frustrating because yeah. you're like come on just tell us we know what you're thinking mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. i think one of the thing that some things that sometimes frustrates me about you know christians as a whole let's just say christians as a whole um is that we so often don't ride on humility like this is from the liberal perspective to the conservative perspective we have this like ownership on truth in which we know all of the details about who god is and what god thinks about sexuality what god thinks about war what god thinks about all of these various topics um and we think it's settled i mean that that's it and i think that we as a as a church could do a lot better to say we don't know well, this is our best guess. This is the the place I come from. This is where I've learned to come to my conclusions. But at the end of the day, let's be honest, it's my best guess. Um, so it's possible that gays and lesbians are an abomination. I mean, it's a, it's possibility for anything. Let's be let's be. I mean, how much of us do, really are going to come to the table and say like, I know exactly how to read the Bible. You should listen to me. You know, like I know all of the details. I can work them out for you. That weird story about Zipporah and Moses, I got it. You know, <laughs> that, <laughs> listen to me. I mean, I really think like we should be more people. I mean, we talk a lot at Level Ground about um, we see through a mirror dimly. And that is something that we should all embody as people when we come to this conversation, when we come to any conversation. And and if we were to willing to own more of that, we could probably have more gracious spaces for everyone. But we fail to say to the other person, you know, like, oh, you're so far behind. You're in the Stone Age. You haven't figured that out. When really addressing that we're all coming from a context that's informed us to get to where we are now. My parents are fairly conservative, grew up in a conservative environment. Um, there literally is not a single church that is affirming in Salisbury, Maryland. Not one. Not a single church. So what? what's the expectation for them? Like, they've never been to seminary. They've never, um, other than having some relatives who are gay, they, they've had rel- relatively few interactions with people that are gay. And I am supposed to, as a, someone who's come to a liberal conclusion, who's lived all around the world, who's lived in England, who's gone to seminary, look at them and be like, you're so far behind. That to me feels so unfair. You know, like they are where they are because of their context and they are, you know, responding to me as someone who's gay in literally the most loving way they could. And they've done a wonderful job, but have moved in the pace that they know how and are, are capable of with the community that they live in. But you wouldn't like say the same thing about race issues, right? Like, so take a hundred years back and there's more sermons. They're like, well, let's be open and honest. You know, African Americans may just be the lesser race or women, Right, so like there's we some, do do that about women uh, though. Y'all still do that? No, I mean like think about the church now. The church exists still in some I question of women in leadership. Some uh, churches, yeah. I was about to say like that. My, my wife's ordained, so but um, <laughs> but but you, you don't have like let's have a cultural conversation about if right. women are equal, right? Um, I think you know the thing. I I think I, I was at a lecture that Chris Hedges gave over the weekend, and I think. F- I experience the turnoff on the liberal side most when I'm with like the KPFK crowd uh-huh. and or the even Occupy, you know, I'm, I'm like, you're so proud of how right you are that you won't even deign to like acknowledge the humanity of someone who disagrees with you. Um, and to me, it's a self-defeating argument. Like, I feel like if you are so progressive and so open-minded except for the people who disagree with you which really is the same thing that's happening on the other side i don't i don't for me it doesn't mean that i have to say well maybe gay people are an abomination i i i'm not interested in like even having that kind of like negotiating that point but i do think i have to acknowledge the humanity of people who think that gay people might be an abomination as much as I would want them to affirm the humanity of gay people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which right. is different than, which is, it, but like, what you're wanting to acknowledge the dignity of the person, and and you're saying, actually, uh, you are using power to have the dignity of a person ignored, right? Like, your opinion doesn't mean that uh, people 
don't get to be with their partners in hotel, you know, in the hospital and right. that kind of thing. So there's like material things that impact another person. It's sort of like in when a I'm, different I'm, way. Yeah. That's why. That's why to me the interesting thing around uh, like film and art is how much it invites uh, a conversation that doesn't begin with the theological agenda or the political one because we all know those scripts and um, uh, like. If I get in one, I'm just like, uh, in my head, what runs through it are these stories I know I assume the other person doesn't know, right? Like, as a more progressive person, when I hear uh, friends or family members that are much more conservative say just outlandish things, in my head, they're calling very dear friends of mine horrible things. Mm -hmm. And I go, you don't know them. And that's what I get mad about, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you're sitting there going, you don't know. Like, these are some of the most beautiful human beings that you're throwing under the bus. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you're doing it. And so uh, to me, I, I, I'm really excited about the idea of film being a way of having a conversation. And it will be as challenging, I think, for progressive people to yeah. be there as oh, yeah. it will for conservative ones. Because um, the, uh, uh, I, I think for, um, for progressive people, it is it, it, when you hear someone talk, you're not hearing them talk about Leviticus, you're hearing them talk about your uncle mm-hmm. or your yeah. cousin or your well, best I mean, me friend. Me or me, yeah. Yeah. My, me personally. Yeah. I, but I think some of the most beautiful embodiments of this kind of like middle space that willing people are, are willing to live in is like I was sitting, we had the first event we did at Fuller one with one table was um, screening of what Love for Your Die with Bishop Gene Robinson. And the film just depicts him like ex- absorbing a lot of hate. And we had a lot of different kinds of people in that room. One person like asked a question that referred to uh, LGBT people as as pedophiles. And this is two Bishop Dean Robinson sitting on stage, gay man, been married to a man for a long time. And the man just embodies this grace that allows him to ask that question because he doesn't know how to ask it any better. And respond with love and educate him in a way that he may not ask that question the same ever again. And that's where it happens, you know. He may still walk away thinking like, oh, I don't know if it's okay to be gay. But he won't refer to gay people as pedophiles again because of the grace and love he's received from someone who is a part of the gay community. That's like, well, maybe maybe you could word that a little differently. But it's okay that you ask that question. I think we all need ambassadors mm-hmm. for the conversation. And I think about, I went back to thinking about the race, the conversation about race, and we maybe have done ourselves all as a society an injustice because we've stopped talking about it because it's supposed to be done. And now we've lost our ambassadors to have conversations in ways in which race is still playing itself out in unhealthy and prejudicial ways in our society. You know, I thought about as I sit in 12 Years a Slave, I think about that of like, I need an ambassador. Like, like I don't right. know how to talk. I don't know about how to talk. This. About I don't know this. how to embed yeah. it into my narrative, into the way I see the world, and I don't have any spaces in which it feels okay to talk about because we all know it's not okay to be racist or to be segregated. But I now I'm stuck. I can't talk about it without being wrong somehow, you know. And so I think we're trying to create a space to maybe have that conversation in a different way as we're like culturally and socially bumping up against the LGBT community um, in a way in in which there are some spaces to move. And it requires everyone being vulnerable and risking entering this conversation. I mean, it requires me as a straight person saying, there's a lot I don't know. I have a lot of assumptions. This makes me uncomfortable. How do I talk about this? What does this word mean? And it requires Chelsea as someone who's gay to risk being offended or hurt and help gently and lovingly correct me as we kind of walk alongside each other. Um, and, and so I think, you know, that's pretty lofty and abstract and, uh, we're trying to make that accessible through film and through art and through this festival. But I think that sort of is what we're trying to move towards. Mm-hmm. As a pastor, and I think pastors relate to this idea of needing to create this safe space for conversation. Um, the, the way that we ended up doing it, because I, I started with this ideal, like we are all we can all kind of come together and have a conversation. And usually what would happen is that the bullies would take over the conversation. Um, and they would just interrupt and say what they wanted to say and demean other people and belittle them and call them names. And then the, the, the really insightful people would leave because they were like, I can't be a part of this. Right? So all you're left is a room full of bullies. And... And then you're like, well, that didn't work out very well. Like I, yeah. I had this visual, I mean, this ideal of, of a great conversation. So we ended up having to say like rather than control the outcome of the conversation, which would be to say you must agree with me at the end, we were, we were saying 
here are the rules of the conversation. And if you can abide by these rules, you can be a part of the conversation. But not everyone can be a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. You can exclude yourself from the conversation by acting like a jerk, right? And I think that's a really important component because we can't let the – and I think this is happening in our democracy the same way. Mm -hmm. Like people that are really being jerks are controlling the conversation because – they're bullies, and people that have higher ideals don't want to be bullies in return. And so they go, well, we'll just let the bullies have the public square. And then we're all screwed at that point. So I think it's really important to put a frame around the conversation mm-hmm. to say, if you call names, you're not a part of this conversation anymore. If you are um, you know, uh, excluding others by trying to amplify your voice over other people's voices – if, if that's why one the metaphor of one table was so vivid for me that we're sitting together at one table. Everyone gets one seat at the table. You don't get to, you know, bully these four people out of their seats and take mm-hmm. their voices, right? So I think if, if we're going to put, I mean, what we're trying to do, I, th- I think, in level ground is to say, you know, the level ground means you get one spot. You don't get to take all these spots. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, and I think one of the ways we have been talking about this recently is like there's a bell curve. And so there are some people on both liberal and conservative perspectives who are just off the bell curve. Like we're not – they have no interest in being a part of this kind of conversation. They don't have – like I I can't talk to them. I don't know how to talk to them. They're so far outside the bell curve in either direction. And I think, Ryan, I think you're right of saying we – a lot of times people in the middle out of – insecurity or fear or not wanting to be judgmental or a bully then just withhold our voice and so we're trying to create some space for those middle people to actually reclaim a voice and to feel empowered to be in the conversation and trusting that that then is going to shift where that whole curve is taking place and and what the conversation begins with our film as opposed to debating the same bible verses again and i i wonder how much of this issue if do you, do you see playing out in the politics of the denominations and schools and in, um, in friends of evangelicals is really hermeneutics? Like to me that mm-hmm. I that to me settles the issue in a rather simple way that until as long as someone kind of understands the authority of Scripture where uh, there's direct applicability of ancient Near Eastern uh, body fluid codes mm-hmm. to uh, determine people's identities and sexual practices in the present, then there really isn't a conversation to be had that um, where the actual stories of the people present matter and the way our faith and our commitments to play out can be celebrated because, well, it's, it's, it's already settled and you're asking them to abandon, mm-hmm. right, something essential to their religious identity. For uh, the liberal theological tradition has always had, um, I mean, it began by um, really, in a sense, adding experience Mm -hmm. to uh, on a level playing field for sources theologically. Right. And um, one of the and it it creates really weird situations where, like, you and I who have more evangelical upbringings, we kind of feel weird hanging out with them Mm -hmm. because they're like, you don't read the Bible and pray every day, and but you're still Christian. (laughs) Uh, What does this mean? Uh, And and how? Yeah. How do you? You don't have quiet time. (laughs) Why is this? Yeah. What happened to Jesus? Yeah. And so, to me, I I completely get when you said that. I start laughing and think, yeah, that's kind of, I understand. (laughs) Um, But uh, so for like younger evangelicals who don't have the privilege of of being right in a, in uh communities where they have historically missed the experiences of conversation. Mm-hmm. It's like you told a beautiful story about your family, but that's very different than all your peers that are going to be mm-hmm. in pulpits around America at Fuller. Uh, uh so many of the Fuller students and stuff I interact with at the podcast and things like are have continuously framed it as a hermeneutical question mm-hmm. and one that isn't sustainable in the long run. Yeah. I mean, how much? Uh, how much do you think that plays uh, when it goes to church relations, which is a completely different one, right? Than how you treat people, yeah, unless right. you have this hermeneutics yeah. yep. that is sitting there, uh, keeping you from ever validating mm-hmm. like your story right. when you tell it as a way for you to actually right. hear the voice of God. To me, that's a... Yeah. I think one of the things we don't want to recognize as a part of this conversation, or we haven't yet openly, um, is that we are really at the end of the day asking big questions. That the hermeneutics do 
play a part into it in it, but we want the way in which we want to like bring hermeneutics into the conversation is this kind of weird thing that isolates sexuality out of like the whole of scripture in yeah. strange kind of ways. But really, I think where the fear comes from, and it, we'd probably have a lot more productive conversations if we were willing to all say that what we're doing at the end of the day is asking questions about the character of who God is mm-hmm. um, and what the scripture is and the role it plays in our communities. And so while we're talking about LGBT people, um, when we start to like make kind of big claims about those people, it's, be, I think, out of reaction out of us wanting to protect uh, our own understandings of this much, much bigger idea of who God is. And so maybe it would be best for us to say, yeah, these are big questions. We're asking not just questions that affect our interpersonal lives, but the very underpinnings of our faith. And so it's okay to ask those questions too. It's okay to ask questions about who God is. Those are important questions, and we've been doing them historically for centuries. The Jews were a lot better at it than we were, but we should maybe start asking those questions more often and, mm-hmm. and more a part of this conversation. So, Well, and I think also then to recognize there needs to be a lot more gentleness, I think, as we're having this conversation mm-hmm. with people who are come from really conservative backgrounds or really liberal backgrounds or, you know, like we're we're asking questions that are so deeply rooted in our humanity and understanding of self and God. Um, we need to do it with a little bit more patience and humility um, and allow space for those yeah. questions to emerge, which is another reason why I think film and art is so powerful is it doesn't, you can't, it would be a really bad film if it just dealt with sexuality. Um, when, when you're, Engaging just in like theology, yes. it <laughs> only talks about sexuality. Right, it's just it's bad. bad. But if you leave it off the table, it's worse. Right, exactly. So, so film tells these stories in a way that we can't separate how I how I understand my own sexuality from how I understand my own self as creature, or God as creator. You know, whatever. Like we're we're forced to sort of connect things in ways we don't even recognize are happening. And I think that being better able to watch film is going to help us read our Bibles better at the end of the day. And mm-hmm. that is a really powerful thing uh, that we can almost teach a better hermeneutic subversively through a film festival. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that is where the stories, you know, and, and interpersonal stories, but also film kind of stories, art does sort of undermine a hermeneutic rather than trying to like frontal assault, replace one yeah. hermeneutic with another. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we could see this happen all the time in churches, people's economic, you know, to shift the story a little bit, people's economic theories that there are implicit within their psyche that they mm-hmm. grew up with in America and, mm-hmm. well, capitalism and you work hard and you get ahead, you know, and that's just the script until they are, you know, 45 and can't afford to buy a house and they're kind of like, what happened to the script? Or where they meet a homeless person and they say, well, those people are lazy and then they find out. Well, the person's not really lazy. They actually had this, 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 and this happen to them. And, and now they're going, well, what happened to that economic story that I had in my head that mm-hmm. told me how things work out? Mm-hmm. And I think by seeing films and by hearing stories, you know, it, it brings – at least this is what happened to me. It undermined my hermeneutic to say, okay, people's – like my theology and my life come into collision. They collide, right? And at the, at the end of that collision, I have to sort through the rubble and go like, okay, what really matters here? And I mean, I think we can undermine people's, you know, that sounds really bad maybe, but like we can undermine people's broken hermeneutics or limited hermeneutics by introducing them to, to stories that allow them to have another source of, of authority, if we want to put it that way. Well, there's that, that great scene in the movie 500 Days of Summer, which regardless of what you think of that film, the great scene where it goes split screen and it's like what he expected and then reality, and there's these two different narratives that are playing out, and I feel like that's what film does, is it takes our expectation, and it takes our reality, and it puts it in conversation, Um, and then we're kind of left to deal with the pieces of that, and hopefully there are people and communities in your life that you can can do that with, Um, Mm -hmm. but I think... I, I just love that image, that like split yeah. screen. And it doesn't let us turn away. I mean, I'm stuck on 12 Years a Slave because I just saw it recently. And it was incredible. And that scene in which it's like a minute and Steve McQueen does not let you turn away in which he's hanging from that rope and he's barely breathing, you know? Yeah. I, I wanted to turn away. I wanted to not look anymore. And I am forced to sit in my own shame and in my own, I don't know, complicitness in 
my engagement with race, all because I'm, I'm staring at this man hanging from this rope for a minute, you know, long, way longer than I ever wanted to. And I think that that's true for all of film. It, it, it kind of forces our eye to see differently, to sit in something that we wouldn't have probably ever sat in before because we have no idea what to expect. We watch a one, two, one to two minute trailer and still say, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go, you know. We have no idea what the film is really actually about. Like gravity. I mean, no one knows what the film is about other than it's in space and the Ooh. shit blows up, you know? Sandra Bullock. Exactly. <laughs> but they go. Anyway. Yeah. You know? It's the uh, the director is probably going... The interview we did with him is going to be like the week before. Oh, awesome. This one. And, and when, so when you saw that scene, did you think of the the scene in uh, Night with... Uh, um, Eli Wiesel's book, oh. where the child mm-hmm. isn't doesn't weigh enough, and mm-hmm. they're making everyone in the concentration yes. camp walk by the boy that's dangling, and that's when you you know when he uh, Eli Wiesel says you hear someone say you know where is God, mm-hmm. and then say he's there on the gallows. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To me, like yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, Moltmann talks about the experience of reading that having been a German yeah. soldier, and uh, that scene is a Southern American um, is one of those times where all of a sudden the mirror sits there. Oh, yeah. And it makes you ask the question, you know, where is God? And it's clearly not where you want God to be. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so everyone should go see the movie. It was, oh, yeah. it was excellent. We're shamelessly promoting it on this podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what was the point? <laughs> Level ground? <laughs> yeah, there was a film festival. <laughs> all right. So uh, uh, last question. Um, what uh, What is the... Uh, the uh, uh, a most ridiculous uh, practice of sexuality that was uh, uh, handed out in uh, kind of your uh, young life world. Because I, I, we had a young life person on recently who just said, like, I love young life for all these other things, but the main thing it did was made me hate my balls. <laughs> and um, for, for those that don't have evangelical sexual baggage, um, we're sorry. You, you may not find this as amusing. I feel like there's like, I can think of two right off the top of my head. One, there's this like weird rule, which makes me laugh because you're spending, I mean, young life, you spend like 40 hours a week with someone volunteering your time. I mean, like maybe three other leaders and you're going, you're spending like 30 minutes in the car back and forth with them every day. You're going to go hang out with kids. And there's this expectation that you're not supposed to date someone you lead with at that school. And so... Which I just think is so funny because you're spending all your time leading with them. So so much of what you're doing is you're you're sharing passion together. You're caring about kids in the same way. You you know love Jesus, both of you. And so you're like, yeah, this makes so much sense. But then it's like, no. And if it does happen, none of the kids are supposed to know either. So I just think, I mean, that might not be true everywhere. That was true you in the area the that deal. I lived in. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's yeah, like, you definitely. Why would you want to have a relationship with someone that shares your passion? Faith, right. And Absolutely. Yeah. Why? It doesn't make ridiculous. any sense. Marriages why would you work model out that better for kids? I mean, kids you, can't see you yeah. date someone, or they're going to like be led oh, astray. Yeah, obviously. I know that. Like the first time my youth minister had a girlfriend. Uh, the next day, it was just like orgies. Right. And I was like, what happened? <laughs> and I was like, he led me to stumble. Yeah. I mean, clearly, that's exactly yeah. what happened. But it's at the just same like time, if, we... uh, if girls wear two-piece bathing suits without a shirt on over it. Mm. Yeah. I'm I I'm like, that's when you realize that men are not responsible at no. all. At all. They we have no decision-making tools in no, their own don't. brain. We don't. None. Thank you for admitting it. Well, but the great thing is that when you're in high school, you can wear a two-piece swimsuit. But then as soon as you get into college and become a leader, you have to wear one piece. Oh, right. I'm sorry. There's a transition, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a transition. And you can't make purple. I mean, boys live on one side and it's blue, yep. and the girls live on the other side of camp and it's pink, and you can't make purple. Can't make, uh, don't one, ever make purple, uh, ever. Uh, what a, one of the... Uh, one of uh, the uh, lesbian girls in my youth group asks about deep redding. <laughs> well, like, the, what I was going to say is... we were at camp and that's what they use, and I'm just sitting there going, oh, no, they're sensualizing the sexes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's funny to me is when I was at high school and went to Young Life camp, uh, I went with my best friend, and we used our bottom bunk as our, like, closet for the week, and then we both just slept in the bed on the top bunk, and that's not allowed in Young Life anymore. Girls can't share beds at camp, and I just think it's so funny because of the way that this conversation is now trying to be negotiated in our evangelical circles. Um, Yeah. We always laugh, I mean, more, I mean, seriously, because it's like, we carry these two kind of histories, like Young Life shared, Sam and I, and what we do with Level Ground, Young Life and Fuller, and both of them 
uh, are like directly tied to everything that we do. I mean, we have learned so much about who God is through those spaces Mm -hmm. and claim them as a part of our story. And yet uh, they might hesitantly or not really claim us in return. So we think that's, that's kind of funny and ironic at the same time. (laughs) Tell us dates of the podcast, I mean podcast, dates of the film festival and... Yeah, where to well, find it and that film kind of festival thing. is going to be from February twentieth to March second, uh, two thousand fourteen, in Pasadena, California. And you can find more information about it on our website. It's on levelground dot org, or find us on Facebook. And the other big thing that you should know about is that we are running a big Indiegogo campaign right now. And so please support us. We can't make this happen. Um, we can't provide spaces for people to have these conversations without financial support and. Um, we really want and believe in what we want to make what we're doing happen, and we believe in it. And so you can find that at an Indiegogo to, Indiegogo.com uh, and search just Level Ground, and you'll find us. So. Yeah, and we have a launch party coming up on November 9th. It's going to be awesome. It's at the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena. Uh, totally free to come, just RSVP. You can find it on our website. And it's going to be a night of celebrating art at the intersections of faith, gender, and sexuality. So it's going to be awesome. Yeah. That sounds exciting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, um, I, and there will be links to this in the show notes. So if you're sitting there driving, don't wreck. <laughs> Please. Read right. the show notes and at home. Ryan, thank you for bringing friends. Absolutely. They're way cooler than you. All right. So <laughs> we'll, see you at the, we'll see you at the festival. <laughs> Thanks. Adios. Bye. Bye.